Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another evening of Outside In with Sports Basement. Tonight, we are very excited for our Hoka event tonight. With us, we have ultra runner Patrick Reagan, all the way from Savannah, Georgia. And we also have triathlete Julie Moss, um, pretty well-known triathlete. She's accomplished a lot, um, part of the Triathlon Hall of Fame. And you might know her from the 1982 uh, Hawaii Ironman as well. Uh, which I'm sure she'll get into in a little bit. Um, if you haven't participated in one of our outside in events uh, up to this point, uh, we, our September beneficiary is Latino Outdoors. Um, Latino Outdoors um, is a nonprofit and their mission is to inspire, connect, and engage Latino communities in the outdoors and embrace a culture y familia as part of the outdoor narrative, ensuring their history, heritage, and leadership are valued and represented. Um, they do a lot of great stuff here in the Bay Area. Um, they take uh, people on some of their first outdoor trips, whether that's camping or just hiking around, um, backpacking. They do a lot of great stuff for the community in terms of cleaning it up and things like that. Um, if you have some time, check out their website, um, which I will put in the chat bar in just a minute here. Um, but if you do have some time, I would definitely recommend checking out, making a donation if you can, because they're doing a lot of good in the area. Um, and... I think that's all I've got going here. So um, without further ado, uh, I'm going to pass it on. Uh, tonight, our moderators are actually going to be some people from uh, inside of Hoka themselves. We have uh, Teresa Bergman um, and we have Ricky Para, who are both, uh, we've, we've worked with them a lot. We do a lot with Hoka um, at Sports Basement. Um, I have a few pairs that most of our employees do. So we have a lot of interactions with Hoka. So I'm gonna highlight their screens right now and bring them on here. Um, if you guys do have any questions, by all means, please type them in the chat bar on the side. Um, we'll get to them when we get a chance um, at the end. Um, once Patrick uh, uh, talks a little bit, um, he can answer some questions and the same thing with Julie. Um, and also I just realized I forgot to mention what they're gonna be talking about. Um, Patrick is going to be filling us in on his um, fueling and cooling techniques for his, all of his ultras. Um, and Julie is going to be kind of going through her Hoka arsenal and kind of informing us on how to get back from injury um, and get back into after interruptions on training, um, of course, with her Hoka. So, all right, let's get this thing started. Give me one second to uh, spotlight these videos and we'll get into it. So here's Teresa, here's Ricky. Here is Julie, and here is Patrick. All right, take it away, guys. Yeah, so I'm Teresa. Thank you, Austin, for our introductions. Um, our first athlete speaking will be Patrick Reagan, and he's been running professionally for Hoka and Goose since 2017. His accolades include being a three-time Havilene 100 champion, a 2017 Ultra Runner of the Year, taking eighth place at Western States in 2019 and being the 2019 US ATF 100 mile trail champion. He also holds course records at the Bezos Bend 100 and the Havilene 100. Patrick, those are some really amazing um, ultra running accolades. So I think you're the perfect person to really talk to us about nutrition and fueling for long distance. Um, I'll let you take it away and just share some of your expertise in that area with us. Thanks, Austin and Teresa, for the introductions. Um, stoked to be on here with Julie Moss tonight, too. And Ricky, thanks for having us. So um, tonight, I'm going to go through just a bunch of my fueling techniques, uh, keep it really natural. I brought a bunch of props. So I've got all my goose stuff and some of my, my Hoka uh, cooling technology. Um, what I'd like to talk to you all tonight about is, uh, you know, the, the relationship triad between cooling, nutrition, and sending energy to working muscles. Um, you know, m most of the races that I do and the area that I live in um, here in Savannah, Georgia, tend to be quite sweltering, uh, pretty hot conditions. Um, the Havilene 100 in particular is held in the Sonoran Desert uh, at McDowell, um, at the McDowell Regional Park um, near Phoenix in Fountain Hills, Arizona. So you're in quite sandy conditions. Uh, you're very exposed there. Um, everyone in your region, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of your customers at Sports Basement uh, know about the canyons of Western states and, and how, how tough those can be as well. Uh, so these techniques are, are very applicable for, for any races that uh, you, know, you may be doing in California, even cooling techniques that you can integrate into your daily training that can help you to just get to the end of those 
uh, you know, long runs, um, the end of really hard quality sessions in the heat um, efficiently. Um, able to uh, put yourself in a position to, to not be cramping later in events, uh, later in workouts, um, and, and to be sending the right types of resources to working muscles while exercising. So I'm really fortunate that I work with a great nutrition company um, and work with some you know sponsors like Hoka that provide great technologies for me. Um, so a, a few of the first things that I start with when I, when I consider cooling in general, um, a few of my go-tos are the ice bandana, um, so this might look a little funny on my, my green screen background here, but it's a very simple bandana um, that you can fill with about two pounds of ice. So maybe I look like a, a bit of a superhero here with the, with the background. Um, I tend to carry this right around my neck uh, while running ultras. And my crew would usually fill it about softball size um, with ice. And I'd put it on my, my cooling centers right around the spine, um, dripping down the spine, in order to uh, enhance my body's ability to thermoregulate or cool. Um, it, the goal there is to lower your core temperature so that you can continue to send more energy to that triad of digestion and energy to working muscles so that you don't create them. Um, another item that, that I utilize a lot of is, uh, is a Hoka hat. Um, it's a desert cap, so this can be used uh, in a very similar fashion, but on the fly a little bit more. You can see that there's a, there's a large pocket here in the back, and I, I stuff this pocket with about uh, three quarters of a pound of ice as well. So between these two, I'm able to put about three pounds of ice on person, which sounds like a lot, but when you're running in the Sonaran Desert, it tends to melt quite quickly. Um, proper, therm proper thermoregulation or cooling in general will allow me to digest the foods uh, that, that I need to during competition. I, I tend to eat about 400 calories per hour, so it's, it's quite high, um, even for an ultra runner. Um, in 100 mile races, that's about my digestion rate. In a uh, 100 kilometer, 50 kilometer races, um, it tends to be closer to 300. And then if I'm doing anything under 50 kilometers, I'm more in like the two to 250 range. And that's primarily due to the duration of the event um, and just the intensity of the event. Uh, you know, the higher intensity, um, the lower calories per hour, I, I tend to be able to digest and continue to digest without problems. <laughs> um, so a, a few fuels that I use, um, if I'm running a race like Western States where in the high country, it's usually quite snowy, I'll, I'll start with something more solid food wise. I, I've got to remember to put these in front of my face. So they turn up on the screen. Um, now these are, these are waffles. Um, and I will usually pair these with something like a, uh, like a tea, like this is like a summit tea. It's an energy sports drink. So the way that I like to simulate um, early in hundreds is quite similar to a breakfast. So like tea and uh, a waffle. Um, and this works really well for my stomach. Um, what I tend to do early in the race when the temperatures are still quite cool are eat the most solid foods I will eat all day. So I, I'm quite big and meticulous on the variability of nutrition throughout the day. Rather than start with gel, do gel all day, um, I work with the weather. So when it's coolest, I eat the more solid foods, your fruit, your waffles, um, pairing it with some uh, some things like the summit tea to enhance the breakfast. Um, and then I kind of break into more like the gel format in the middle of the day, eating about three of these per hour paired with fruit. And as we hit the hottest parts of the day, I then divert to sports drink. So, so this sports drink, the nice thing about it, and this is a goo roctane energy product. There's about 250 calories a serving. What you can do with it, if you tend to really like it, um, for example, my coach Magda Boulay, she mixes it double proportion. So in an event like Western States, instead of getting 250 calories in a 600 milliliter bottle, she's getting 500 calories per bottle in the section of the race that um, she feels like she can only ingest sports drink. Essentially the relationship for me and the way I look at it is the, the higher the temperatures, the less viscous the material, the easier for your stomach uh, to digest that material. So these liquid energy gels and sports drink are going to be easiest in the hottest parts of the day. Um, as it cools again, uh, you know, if you're going to be out there for 30 hours completing your 100, or if you're going to be running a, a race in cooler conditions, you may be able to divert more to solid foods. But I, I would suggest that this, this triad and this relationship, they're, they're, they're all very interrelated. And like, like I said, that triad is um, sending energy to working muscles, digestion, and thermoregulation and cooling. 
So if you can learn to balance those three, you can do all three well. Um, and in college, you know, a decade ago or so, like I, my coach had always explained, you can do three, two out of three things well. You can, you know, you've got your cross country track and field, you've got um, your social life and you've got your academics, pick two of them. And you better pick the right two if you wanna be on the team. And I think of, I think of that analogy a lot, uh, whether it was when I was coaching college athletes or, or now with ultra running, I think, well, this is a very similar analogy here, this triad of you, you almost need an external source to do all three well. And, and the way I think of topical cooling, the things like the ice bandana and, and the, uh, the, the cap that I use, my desert cap that I provide ice to my body, that's almost like the radiator for a car. It's, it's an external source provided by ice on a regular basis at aid stations, providing, provided by taking your time there so that you continue to do the two important things, digestion and sending energy to working muscles. So that's a bit of a long spiel um, about thermoregulation and nutrition and, and the, the relationship between the two. Um, but, but that's kind of my format. Thanks, Patrick. That's um, actually really cool that you mentioned the summit tea because I just got some of that and I've never tried it. So I was curious if it had a real tea flavor to it. Um, and it sounds like a good morning treat, like before a hike even. Yeah, definitely. I, I like uh, I like how it tastes on the palate in general. The the tea to me uh, at first it tasted very similar to like the Lipton tea, uh, the the scoopable Lipton tea that that you had as a kid. Maybe um, I, I, I like it. It has a little bit of a lemon flavor. Uh, Magda, the way she describes it when she was designing it, it's, it's almost as savory as it is sweet. So. I go to that tea at different stages of the race and almost pair it more with coffee gels and, and chocolate waffles. It, it tends to go quite well with those type of, um, those type of flavors. So. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm going to have to try mine when I can get back, back out to the trails here uh, as soon as the smoke clears a little. Um, we had a couple questions come in before the event. So um, I'll throw some of those your way. Um, a couple people were wondering about, even though you do a lot of ultra work, do you have any advice for people that are trying to work up from like a half marathon into a marathon or a marathon into that first ultra distance of um, kind of just the important tips to remember getting to that double a marathon distance? Yeah, it, it's a tricky balance, uh, and Julie can speak a lot to this too, because me and Julie are talking about a very similar duration uh, in the, those eight to nine hour, 10 hour events. You know, you're going all of a sudden from, from maybe looking at a four, four and a half, five hour marathon to, wow, you're gonna be out there for double the time, not only double the distance, but double the time. Um, for me, the, the big shift was understanding that it's so much more about, um, the ability to consume calories uh, for, for the duration of the event, right? It, whereas in a marathon, I, I always had felt as though I could take a couple gels, a little bit of water by feel. I, I found that I have to be much more meticulous to get to the finish line um, of any ultra at my max capability, right? So the same that uh, a 1500 meter runner focusing on running 400 meter intervals at one mile race pace as an ultra runner you need to be thinking about the the meticulous nature and the specificity of your race plan and and to me that means well what do i need to do in the race i need to be able to understand how to cool well i need to understand how to utilize handhelds um how to utilize the gear i plan to race with how to eat the foods I plan to race with. So by race day, you really need to have all of those little things dialed, right? I think in general, um, you know, the importance of the long run uh, is even more important when it comes to those longer events, the importance of, you know, proper duration, working with a coach to, to make sure that you're not just doubling everything you did for the marathon, but to find a happy balance between understanding, okay, th this is quite different from the marathon, the importance of nutrition, the importance of, like I said, all those different types of specificity um, go up. <laughs> so the same that you would do a, you know, a 12 mile run at, at marathon pace when, when preparing for the marathon, like, right, like doing things at goal pace, you also need to prepare your race plan in a different fashion when preparing for an ultra. Yeah, that's really good advice. I, um, I have not done an ultra yet, but my first um, longer trail race was an 18 mile trail race that I hopped into. 
So I did not have any of those things you mentioned down other than wearing the right shoes um, and gear for it. But luckily it wasn't too hot um, and not 18 miles, it wasn't out there too long. So I didn't have to worry as much about cooling. Um, but I definitely discovered the hunger factor pretty early on of just being on the trails that long and on my feet. Um, and I had to eat more solid food than I had ever done in a race. So that was the biggest challenge was like eating something larger and then trying to get back out from the aid station. That was a little tricky for me without <laughs> having ever yeah. practiced. So I learned, learned my lesson. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of good things on the table, so it's it's tricky to to walk out of there when you're staring at oh I'd like a little more watermelon, right? Or that that bit of sweet looks really good, but you know it's it's tricky to to push yourself out of the aid stations always. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially if you sit down. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um, someone else asked what your go-to pair of hokas is, which might be a hard question. You might have some for training or racing, but kind of your favorite Hoka's to run in? So I, I do as many road ultras as I do trail ultras, and uh, uh, that's maybe different from from quite a bit of the the, the population of Hoka athlete. Um, I, I really love the Clifton Edge currently. Um, I'm a big fan of the shoe. I feel like I would, I would wear that for the last 40 miles of Western States, even though it's a shoe built for the road. Um, it seems as though it would be fantastic for anything from an event like Comrades or a 50 mile road race, like like a 100K road race, all the way to the latter stages of a non-technical 100 mile race. So I'm a big fan of the Clifton Edge currently. Um, I'm also loving the Clifton 7 and the Rincon. When it comes to trail shoes in general, uh, last year I ran Western it's in the Evo Moffate 2 and loved that shoe. Um, I wear I wore one pair of shoes, one pair of socks at Western States. So so that shoe is very versatile as well. Um, it got me through deep snow in the high country, um, plenty of grip on those uh, kind of baby heads and and the the snow cups um, in the upper high country or, or the sun cups. And then it, it took me all the way to really dry conditions in the canyons. So I, I love those those particular three models. I would say the Rincon, the Evo Moffate two. Um, the, I love the challenger too. So the challenger ATR has been my go-to shoe for, for any sort of, uh, non-technical trail racing as well. Yeah. The challenger seems like it's a really versatile shoe for people, something that you can use, um, both on different trains. So for a runner like you, that does versatile running, you're constantly on road or trail surfaces. That seems like it would be a really good one, especially living in Georgia, you probably definitely meet some of those um, like rail to trail and gravel roads. Yeah, it's really nice in particular, the Challenger to to hop off of a uh, pavement onto maybe a, a grassy berm. You know, we don't have too many berms here in the, the southeast where I'm at. So, you know, really running through people's yards sometimes, <laughs> hopping on the single track trail, hopping onto a sandy beach, back onto road. The Challenger is extremely versatile. And um, I find that the surface area of that shoe in particular has been great for me at Havelina. Um, so the desert conditions, that's something I think about is what does the general surface area of the shoe look like? Um, you know, Magda wears something like the Clifton or the Clifton Edge for something like Marathon de Saab as well. So when you're thinking about a sandy race, a shoe with that big surface area, not with extremely deep lugs would be great as well. Yeah. And we had one more question for you come in. Do you have a favorite running location? So a favorite place to train or a favorite race? Um, I, I, I love a couple races that I've repeated quite a few times, uh, the Havilene 100 in particular. I, I love running in the Sonoran Desert. Um, I, of course, love training at home in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, one of my favorite international races is the Ultra Vassen, which is the summer version of the Vassa Lopet. What the, uh, it's a 90-kilometer historic cross-country skiing race, uh, Nordic style in uh, Mora, Sweden. So I love that trail as well. Um, all very flat, very non-technical uh, type races. It's hard to not love Western States. I don't think I've done it enough times yet though to say that it's my favorite uh, terrain. Good. Well, thank you so much for sharing some of your running expertise and just some fun facts about your running with us. I'm going to pass it off to Ricky who will introduce uh, Julie for us. 
Hey, Teresa, sorry, be, before we do that, I do have a couple questions, two, a couple more oh, questions yeah. from the crowd here for you. Um, one of them, Patrick, is uh, from Lacey here. It says, uh, during your years of coaching and being coached, um, what do you think is the most common mistake that you see in training or competition? Like, is it form or race strategy, gear, nutrition, and how would you correct it? I think more than anything, Lacey, it's uh, misjudging perceived exertion early on in a race. And, and I mean, primarily going out too fast and learning proper pacing wire to wire, especially when you get into these longer races, even, even when they're not ultras, like when they're, when it's an 18 mile trail race uh, for Teresa, that maybe she expects it, it, it to be the same, a similar duration to an 18 mile road run, right? It's very different when you're talking trail running in any format. So I think that really dialing in and training on the, the type of terrain an athlete plans to run on is the best thing they can do for their, their upcoming race. So as a coach, what I dive into probably more than anything else is both the specificity, getting you on the terrain that you plan to race on, using the gear you plan to race with at the paces you plan to race at. And I do a lot of that in my own personal training. A lot of my athletes do that. I, I make them run that 100 mile race pace if they're planning to race 100. And it feels so awfully slow, right? But they need to understand that from an efficiency and a, a running efficiency and economy standpoint. And that kind of gets back to the form you're talking about, right? Like in order to run a, a particular pace, like if I want to go run a 24 hour race, I need to understand how to run those paces that feel extremely slow for that hour run on the surface I plan to run it on like a 400 meter track. So really practicing specificity will maybe help you to eliminate um, some of those error errors, or if you are a coach Lacey to eliminate the errors for your athletes, you know, getting them to understand how to, how to evenly pace uh, an event. So they have some left in the tank towards the end to, to have a good finish. Awesome. Thanks Patrick. Um, just, Private personal note there that sometimes is difficult if you're running with a dog because my dog at least wants to like go like right away and so my starting pace is like a full sprint and then like after a half mile it kind of slows down but um very good advice there um i have one more question for you before we uh move it along um brian wants to know if you have any like tips or recommendations on increasing your pr for a half marathon uh, yeah, Brian, um, you know, it's always good to, to work with a coach in general when preparing for a specific event, someone or an advisor of some sort that, that you think can help you to prepare and uh, provide the right type of both specificity, as we've been talking about, but also periodization. So doing the right work at the right speeds at the right time and, and the approach to a half is really important. Um, I find that there are a few marquee workouts that have always really prepared me well for the half marathon whether it's one kilometer repeats on short rest at race pace or uh, one mile repeats, you know, very similar fashion, um, you know, improving your VO2 max in general, um, you know, don't, don't get too far away from that, that shorter track work that'll help you to improve your running efficiency or running economy. Um, don't walk away from your 5K and 10K development because that will help you to really run a faster half marathon long-term. So I, I think that there's, there's value in, still trying to improve at the shorter distances um, in order to, you know, improve at the half marathon. So maybe if you're a little stagnant at the half and, and you're, you know, you're hungry to get better there, experiment around, you know, go, go try a trail race of a longer distance, um, you know, for your, your regular long run, you know, replace that one weekend, give yourself something fresh. Um, there's plenty of great resources out there. You know, if you, uh, if you want, you know, a few marquee workouts, you can shoot me an email to Patrick Reagan running at gmail.com and, and maybe I can help tweak a few things for you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Patrick. Sure. All right. Cool beans. Hello everyone. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, I was definitely, I was definitely taking some notes over here as one who is hoping to get into ultras sometime soon. Uh, definitely nutrition is something I am not good at at all. So that was good insight for sure. Uh, along with what Julie is about to talk about with regard to coming back from injury and 
uh, any sort of training uh, interruption. I'm notorious for injury, so I may be taking notes here as well. But for those of you who aren't familiar with Julie, Julie Moss is super rad. Uh, Iron Man and USA Triathlon Hall of Famer. Uh, she is the author of the book, uh, Crawl of Fame, um, which kind of speaks to her competing in the 1982 Iron Man in Hawaii. Uh, in which she did that as part of her senior thesis, which is pretty, it's one killer way to do a thesis, that's for sure, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, she's gonna be speaking to us today about, yeah, coming back from injury and training interpretation, along with kind of her Hoka arsenal and how that has assisted with her in her comebacks from injury. So Julie, I will let you take it away. Oh, thank you so much, Ricky and Teresa. And Patrick, can I have one quick question before I start? Can you talk about what you might add to your nutritional arsenal as far as salt and any other anti-cramping products? I, and um, I, I'll, I'll tie that back in with, with what I'm going to say, but I'd love to hear what you have to say about that real quick. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the salty products in particular, Julie, helped me to, to keep that comfortable gut as well. Um, funny enough, uh, I have a pretty clean diet, but when I go into races, I, I love Pringles and chips. So... I get a lot of my extra salt uh, from, from potato uh, in particular and, and really like the, the baked format of, of, that, um, of that particular variety. Um, the Roctane formula in particular, though, that Magda designs, uh, it has quite a bit more BCAA, branched chain amino acids, sodium, magnesium, potassium, than the general um, gels do. So the Roctane formula... Uh, for the most part, for the races that I run, um, I found that this is enough. As insurance, uh, starting at hour one, I always take one electrolyte capsule, uh, period, to start with. And then as I notice uh, I'm craving a little bit more salt, that's when I kind of start on that train with chips later in the race. All right. Well, to tie in with all that great information that Patrick shared with everybody about nutrition, when I did my first Ironman in 1982, we had bananas, oranges, and defiz Coke and water. And I got to tell you, I probably haven't eaten another banana with any joy since that 1982 Ironman, when that's all you have for nutrition. And that's a lot of volume for what, 90 calories? That's not a lot of calorie content in that. And so obviously in those early days of triathlon, nutrition was really challenging. And they say, what, what is the difference now between, you know, 1982 and now what the their athletes are doing in 2019 and, and even some races now in 2020, but it's nutrition. It is really the, the, techni the technology, the aerodynamics on the bike, I think they pale in comparison to nutrition. I think that is really what keeps you able to um, perform at your optimum. And, and the only way you get that is by practicing, practicing and training. And um, this is, I'll just say one note, and this is, I'm gonna say this as a cautionary tale. If you are using your products that you're going to race with in training, which is really good to do, and you're doing something with a high carbohydrate content, you're adding a carbo load to your water bottle um, to get that double the, the calories, and you can get cavities with letting that, that product sit on your teeth for five, six hours, and then if you go for you know another two hours of running. So no one told me that. And then I go to my dentist, and here I am, this woman who's never had cavities her whole life, and it's like, you've got two cavities. And I, re I put two and two together. So, and then someone said, oh yeah, you're supposed to rinse your mouth out with water, you know, in between, like rinse that product off your teeth. So for those of you who are really adamant about doing everything to the letter in your training that you're going to mimic and mimic your training in racing, be careful of those super uh, carbohydrate powders and things because they can do some crazy weird stuff with your teeth. So I'll just shift to, I've had this amazing career in triathlon. I started in 1982. And as Ricky said, I was part of my senior thesis, which means I was not a swimmer, biker, runner, but yet I saw the Ironman on television and I thought, what the hell? I'm gonna, that would be perfect combination as a kinesiology major at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Um, there were hot guys in Speedos. What can I say? I was 23. All those things, it was in Hawaii. So why not? And I really didn't think about the fact that I was undertrained for everything. And even when I landed in Kona, I had never done um, the full distance for the bike or the swim yet. However, I had 
jumped into the deep end of the pool for marathoning and having did my longest run of eight miles. I think um, eight weeks before the Ironman, I did my first marathon. And oh man, to get to that 20 mile mark and slam into that proverbial wall was classic. And it really, I mean, from going from eight miles now, I'm at, at 20 miles and I'm just now like hitting the wall. That was uh, some natural, probably some natural endurance was in play. But that was such a bad experience that I turned around about five weeks later and did another marathon because I needed to have a positive image of what it could be. And for you runners, you'll, you will laugh at me at this, but I, I was so inexperienced that I thought I need to run even splits. I've been hearing the runners talk about even splits. So I'm going to get to the half marathon mark and I'm going to run. I think I wanted to run 330. That was just in my mind that I would run 330. So at an hour and 42 minutes, I get to the halfway mark. So I stood there at the aid station, having a little sip of water and chatting up the guys at the aid station and saying, oh, no, no, I have to run even splits. I'm, I'm too fast. You know, obviously, you know, you kind of like to amortize that over the next 13 miles. But as it turns out, I didn't hit the wall till 23 miles. And um, I came in at a 332. So I was close, but I still banged into the wall. Um, three weeks later, I'm running the marathon in Hawaii. So I'm, and I did not hit the wall until mile 26. It was that point two that uh, sent me down on the ground. And really it was, you know, the nutrition just, I was on um, the nutrition just did not work over that distance um, for, again, someone who was pretty inexperienced at cycling, pretty inexperienced at, at, uh, at swimming. And I had, you know, mm, two marathons under my belt within, you know, the last six weeks. So um, everything I did wrong, but what I did right was I was joyful about the experience. And I was stoked to be there. I was learning something every day. I arrived three weeks before the race. Literally, I finished my marathon and hopped on a plane and got to Hawaii and finally found these mentors and these experienced athletes that could tell me about the sport at 1982. You couldn't find another triathlete in your town. I mean, the, the sport just was so brand new. And so that was meant I could sort of figure it out. I didn't feel like I had any expectations. Um, to be leading that race was pretty wild. And, um, and to go through this this amazing experience and Patrick, you, you, and even Teresa, you, well, Ricky, we all know when you push yourself to the limit and you think you're at the edge of what you, you can possibly do and somehow you find a way to keep going, that's where true growth happens. That changes your life. And I think that's the addictive quality of endurance sports and ultra sports is that it allows you to go deep within yourself. You know, yes, there's a different kinds of terrain and it's all very challenging, but when you navigate that inner terrain of going deep within to mine what you never knew existed and you find there's this resource, it's, it's, a, it's, it's mental, it's physical, and it's spiritual because it unlocks parts of yourself that you didn't know existed. That's the, that's the, that's the juice. And that has kept me coming back to this sport year after year. And I would say um, I kind of, as a 60 year old athlete, I knew I wanted to do Hawaii again, um, the world championships, and I wanted to qualify for it and go. And then I also then wanted to take the next year. 2018 was my final Ironman. 2019 was going to be my final half Ironman um, and world championships at both. And as a mom, I got to share both of those experiences with my son, Matt's Allen. So he's out there racing, I'm racing with him, something I never thought would be possible. And all the, it took every bit of my experience over 35 years to have these final races be absolutely staying in the positive zone, to not let anything get in the way of being completely um, filled with gratitude and focus and positivity. And obviously I'd done just amazing training. And so I was like, I was like so confident that I was going to put myself in a position to have the kind of finish that I'd always dreamed of. And, 
And then I had um, this issue with my hip and it had been there in 2017. It sort of kind of showed a little bit. 2018, oh, it was there. And 2019 was really coming down to the half Ironman distance was because I knew my body really couldn't sustain the training of a, the Ironman training anymore. But yet on the day of the races, the hip just sort of went away. And this is, and this is um, the double-edged sword of being an endurance athlete. We learned to, to block out pain. And I was able to do it for years and train at a high level and race at a high level. And when I finally said, my season's done, the hips waiting for me. Oh yeah, I, it was it was waiting. In fact, I it's I'm just past the three month mark of having my left hip replaced, and that's a weird thing to go in and say. Here, take a chunk of my body and put in titanium, and we'll just you know we're just going to keep on going from there. Um, it was more the idea of letting go of this identity of this athlete who doesn't get injured over my career. I've been very lucky that way. Sorry, Ricky. I really, I didn't, <laughs> I, I, I did not get injured. And I finally understood and had empathy for people who are dealing with their issues. I didn't think of it as age. I thought of it as, you know, this is a, an athlete's injury. And it was felt like the first time that I was experiencing that and I was able to overcome it for the sake of racing. And when I sat down with my orthopedic surgeon, I sat in his office and I thought he'd be so impressed with me. I was gonna list off my, all my accomplishments. And I said, you know, I've been racing for two years. I knew this was an issue. And he looked at me and he said, well, if you'd come to me two years ago, I would have said, get your racing out of the way. Because once you have the surgery, this hip isn't made to do the kind of things that you're used to doing. And that was kind of shocking to hear that. I mean, it's not gonna be an option for me to come back and do the 50th anniversary of Kona at the age of 70, if I want to. And he said that he does have all long distance runners who have had their hips replaced, but they're willing to go in for repeat surgeries to have linings replaced. And he said, this just, this surgery isn't made to be, to, to last for what you want to do. So that was kind of a real reality check on who, who am I as an athlete if I don't have endurance in my future? And again, you go back to gratitude, positivity, and I think when you, you've done a lifetime of training, it's like getting the most out of what you can do. And I, on a given day in a race, yes, you have expectations of times, but your body is saying, this is what I can do. And to maximize what you can do on that day, is success that is victory and so there i was um having my my hip done and they said oh you're one of our younger patients at 61 and so as soon as elective surgery opened up um i was one of the first uh surgeries they did and going in to have my operation they said you have to wear closed-toed shoes leaving the hospital so i'm going to show you my recovery arsenal these are hapunas but what i did was i put in elastic laces and lace locks so i was preparing for the surgery with the way I would prepare for an Ironman. I needed to have my gear ready to go. And it was like this mental thing of the night before my surgery, I'm lacing up these laces and it kind of put me in that Ironman, tomorrow's Ironman mode. I'm going in for a big, it's a big event and I'm kind of taking my go-tos. And so laced up my lace locks, walked out of the hospital with my little wheelie cart. And then for the next month, the recovery slides. Okay, did they name those because they're the perfect shoe for getting your hip replaced? Seriously, these I lived in these for a month. I walked my first walk around the block with the with the walker, and then my second walk around the block with just with the two crutches and then one crutch. And this was all with this idea that I don't know where I'm going to be with in my recovery when this is done, but I have goals and. As a coach, obviously, Patrick, you know, setting a goal and, and stating it is something that really helps. Ah, oh, yay, cheers. <laughs> so one of my goals is to uh, get back to running maybe up to, I don't know, um, let's just say a 10K or to just to run to the point where you feel like your heart rate's up. And so I ran three miles today without stopping. And the way I did it was I know I've been walking seven miles, yeah, up to 10 miles I've been walking. And I know my legs are strong because I've, 
I feel like the muscles are coming back. And I thought it's a mental thing now. It's like, I'm going to walk out that door and I'm going to run and not stop. And I kept thinking it's mile 23 of the Ironman. I'm tired, but I am going to find a rhythm that allows me just to keep going. And I, it was so fun to lock into that feeling again, that feeling of being an endurance athlete after a long time. So with the other, uh, the shoe, it's not a Hoka, it's my Finise kicking fins. These were so great when the pool, I could swim in the pool and then with COVID, it's been very hard to schedule lap time. So I've been going into the ocean and I kick a lot. I just kick a lot. And I think it's really, as, an, as a runner, as an endurance athlete, it's another way to work your legs that isn't pounding on pavement. So it's working your glutes, it's working your quads, it's working your, um, your hamstrings. And that has been, I've been kicking a ton. Um, it also helps with swimming um, because you go pretty fast with those fins, but it also helps if you've got any shoulder issues as a swimmer to put fins on. It just takes a little relief off your shoulders. So I have to talk about, I'll show you this. This is my um, Clifton Edge. And this is what, this is what Patrick's talking about in Magdalites is this cool extended kind of surface. And so when I was running today wearing not these because these are too clean. My other ones are pretty dirty. But I, when I was running, I kept thinking I'm a I'm a foot a, a four foot striker, and I thought I'm I'm not making taking advantage of this cool ride. So I was spending a lot of time thinking about rolling, and it, you can teach yourself new things at any age. And so maybe this is a different type of running style that I'm going to adopt to allow myself that extra cushion in rolling. Um, and then I think finally, I just want to talk about my aspiration shoe that's sitting here. The Speed Goat. This is the, the, mid, the mid Speed Goat. And it's, um, it's got great things like Gore-Tex in it and these Vibram soles. And no, don't worry, Patrick. I'm not going to challenge you to, uh, you know, to an ultra. But I do want to do some ultra hiking. And I think um, having this sitting there you know, in my gear rack, just calling to me saying, Julie, this is waiting for you. So I'm building up and to the point where I can go out and, and do chunks of the PCT and just sort of acclaim a new part of my life. Things that I, I didn't make time for when you're training for an Ironman, it seems like, and especially when you're, you have high goals, you put everything into it. And it seems like this this world has opened up. So yes, I'm recovering from an injury. And yes, it's a, um, it's, it was in my, and for me, it was by choice. I knew I needed to correct a situation and I was going to feel better. And I may not follow the same path before, but it's opened up these doors and windows to me that I never knew existed. So that's kind of, that's kind of my deal. Um, I've really been fortunate to, uh, my recovery's gone really well. And it's weird because COVID and recovery sort of linked up together. It just, it made me feel like everybody is kind of having to figure out different ways of doing things. And um, I'm just really happy to see that we're emerging in some of our sports are happening again. And for the people who never ran before, can you believe how many people you've seen out running and walking? It has been, the, it's been a real go-to for so many people. So it's been fun to share that with them walking and not feel too jealous of the ones who run by me. Whoa. <laughs> too, too much? <laughs> no, that was awesome. No, that was great. Uh, no, I mean, that's pretty cool, honestly, because I think, I mean, it's a well-known phrase, when one door closes, another begins, and not to say that one door necessarily closed all the way still, but the fact that you're, already, like, you're looking at other aspirations, you're looking at, okay, what can I do now that surgery is done, I'm in recovery, and you're looking at wanting to hike ultra distances and things like that along PCT, so that's awesome. And I think had I not had the devotion and the, the ability to just give myself to my sport the way I had for the last two years, mm -hmm. this, would have been, this would have been harder for me. If my 
penultimate year had been 2020 as a think about the Olympic athletes out there that they were gearing for 2020. That is, that's such a huge emotional psychological blow to kind of have something taken from you as opposed to choosing to redirect your life. So again, when it comes down to, and I, this is what I love about endurance sports. It gives you a lot of time to readjust to flip your switch because as you you're cruising along nutrition's doing well you're cooling yourself you're everything's clicking and then as things start to sort of shift and you can't become more challenging and you have to problem solve problem solve problem solve and usually it's nutrition hydration cooling mm -hmm. and then it's like then it's just that will that will to find a way to keep going. And what gives me that confidence to keep going is trusting in my training. And, and when you've got fabulous coaching, trusting that your coach is, has led you down the right path. And to, to know that you've put the time in, you are, you are deserving of the fight to come back up to your potential and keep going. And again, Every time I feel, I say when I'm racing, I'm getting cranky or I'm not into it. It's because I need calories. That's like my first thing. And I was thinking, Patrick, tell me what is it when you know you're the when you're getting in trouble. What are your some of your signals for you to know that I've got I got to pay attention here. Yeah, usually that uh, that that general queasy feeling that I need more calories, but it's becoming tricky to to put those calories into the system. Uh, and the, that's the trigger that you then hit this decision point of, do I need to ratchet back the pace and focus on the calories or is it worth the risk? What stage of the event am I in? And if it's, you're hitting that stage with 5% of your event to go, you may be able to hammer and just close it up. <laughs> but if you're early on, it, you know, for example, if you're still in the high country at Western States, <laughs> you know, you're 20% in and you should really ratchet back. So, so for me, I notice that need for salt, um, that queasiness in my stomach, or if it's more of a hydration issue, uh, uh, not putting enough ounces or uh, milliliters per hour in, um, I get almost like a, like a very tunnel vision kind of feeling. So those are the two things I really look for and pay a lot of attention to, Julie. And it's one of the things that, that like, specifically for this last um, Ironman in Kona in 2018, my mantra was gratitude. Because in 2017, I was in fabulous shape. I came in confident. And I did the classic, as you were talking about, the rookie mistake of I just went out too hard. I was feeling so good. I blew myself up. And, and, and I only had myself to blame. And that was, that was a bitter pill. So to, to mind reset coming back in 2018 with the gratitude and knowing that it's, I train specifically to not think about anybody else's pace, but my own, to not engage with anybody else and to stay very focused with what I had trained to do. But I had a mantra and this one was just gratitude for the ability to, to move through the race. Do you have a mantra in your mind, Patrick, when you get late in a race that you just kind of tell yourself? Yeah, I, I can really connect with the gratitude aspect that I didn't want to hop in and cut you off there, Julie, but, uh, you know, the, the vision, anytime I line up for my distance of choice, which is, I love a hundred miles, I, I'd race eight of them a year if I could, I can't, <laughs> um, yeah, but um, my mantra is usually early on, you know, stick to the process, um, keep running, keep eating. And the process for me is usually uh, I tend to be the type of runner that, that runs from behind and takes my time and capitalizes at the right moments in the race. So those process oriented mantras help me a lot. Um, and, you know, sometimes when it's not going so well, hey, be gracious, you, you know, smile, look around, where, where are you, you know, like you're you get to move along a trail, these vast, crazy distances a lot of people would be grateful to, to cover one mile doing what you're doing, right? So being grateful, um, having gratitude is, is a really important one for me as well. I connect there, definitely. And, I, and, that, and getting into those places where things aren't going just so well is when you start stripping off layers and you get down yeah. to the essence of, of who you are as an athlete, who you are as a person. And um, I think that enriches your life every time. It never gets old to kind of 
have to get deep into yourself and, and find a way to stay positive, to stay grateful. It takes hard work. And um, I think it's, it's a beautiful thing to, for anybody who is pursuing something that they think is, is a little too hard or a little too long or they didn't think they could. One, those dreams are important to make them hard and, and kind of crazy and, and that will take work to get to. But in that process of, of sticking with it and getting to your finish line is, um, is a very special privilege that you've offered yourself. I think if you put that goal first, if you make that the A goal of, you know, finish line? the finish line, yeah. th that should always yeah. be the A goal. And oftentimes I'll get that question approaching our race, Julie, where what's your goal, you know, and they're expecting, do you want to run this time? And the goal is the finish line. Like you have to respect how far this is. This is a full Ironman or this is my first half marathon or, or this is a hundred mile race. I mean, every level of that, it's relative to the individual. And the first thing you need to respect is the finish line. And I think that that moment, that engagement is when you will uh, decide this is a process oriented activity. <laughs> and sure, I can enjoy myself, but I need to be very patient and smart about my choices the whole way. And I think in 1982, what the, what the, what the public got to see was, I didn't win the race, but it was about respect for the finish line. And doing what was necessary to get to the finish line is a personal victory and translates, uh, you know, differently, um, especially when it's a struggle than when somebody comes across and makes it look easy, right? So, and yeah. that's, I love that the mantra now for Ironman is, you know, it's everybody who crosses the finish line, it's, that's a victory just to get to the finish line. That's what I love about ultra running cultures as well. It's that you, you see even more people there for the last finisher at Western States than you do for the winner or, or as many, right? It, there's a celebration of the community coming together and saying every person is as important as every other, that this, this finish line is ours. Right. And, and that's, that's what I think I connect with the most um, in the sport. And that's, uh, that's been a nice change for me coming from maybe a background of, Olympic distances that are a little bit more cutthroat <laughs> um, and it, it, it's a different feeling there there's no separation there's there's no uh, it, it's almost like Ursula K. Le Guin's writing when she talks about uh, in her book The Dispossessed or if you read any of her stuff where she talks about every person being equal and and as important as every other um, so and that's what it feels like to me it feels like this this beautiful social balance um, yeah I love that about the sport yeah so if I'm walking I'm a champion. If I get to my, you know, my goal of walking five miles, it's that inner champion that you have to keep nurturing and keep taking care of. And at any stage, whether you're recovering from, you know, a hip replacement or you've, you've missed the goal by this much and you go back again to go get after it. It's that inner champion that, um, that we really fire up when we, when we push ourselves physically. I love it. Love it. Nice. That's awesome, guys. No, that was that was great conversation. Great <laughs> insight on a lot of different things. No, I, I'm sure we all can apply that in our lives, whether in sport or just daily life, for sure. Uh, so, I mean, Julie, I do have a couple questions that Good. were submitted as well. Uh, so going back to a little bit of what you said of uh, trusting the trusting in your training, trusting in, in that process. Uh, one of the questions I had here, kind of backtracking to your 1982 uh, go at the Ironman, uh, after that attempt, or after that finish, attempt, oof, after that finish, did you find yourself kind of changing your training regimen since, or like, how did you find yourself like, I guess, shifting your changing regimen after finally completing one? Well, I mean, this was sort of just a fluke. It was just going to be a one and done, get my degree and, and never, never come back to sports. And um, because of the notoriety, it, it sort of offered me an opportunity then to consider pursuing this sport. Um, and it's weird, but professionally, because the ABC coverage got so much attention that now every other network wanted to put a race on TV and the, the, the sport was just exploding. And I now was the poster girl for, for this race. And so I thought, well, I have an opportunity here to travel 
hang out with those guys in speedos, travel. And I thought, well, now it's now I can learn how to train. So I actually had to learn how to train. And that was intimidating because the, these were good athletes coming from different backgrounds. And for me to, um, I had an apprenticeship now, kind of, and it was, fortunately, it was, you know, I was traveling and I was getting the best information that I could hanging out with the, the top athletes. But it took me, I'd say, till 1989 before I finally put the pieces of training together and felt like I came into this sport that year. It seemed like seven years it took me to kind of, to you know to to learn how to train and to and to come out a race now with the idea that i think i've done the kind of training a professional would do and let's just they'll let the chips fall where they may and um that was a that was a great period of my life nice awesome uh the next the question we got in uh tying into again that that go at the iron man is with it having kind of, as you phrased it, uh, being a fluke, <laughs> that first go at it in 1982 uh, for your thesis, uh, what inspired you? Like, what, what was the thesis uh, about that made you want to go for oh, it? The, the, I think the title I came up was uh, training, Physiological and Training Considerations for a, an Ironman Distance triathlon. I mean, really triathlon was a brand new word. Like you had to keep, you know, no one knew how to spell it. And I just kind of, I did some studies with pigs on treadmills and um, I basically, you know, the, the research was, was botched and I didn't put that much time into it, kind of the way I did most of my schoolwork. But the, the Iron Man in my mind, that was another little piece that I somehow I thought I have to finish this race or I'm not going to graduate. I mean, so again, not only that, that I put pressure on myself to my bottom line was I don't get to the finish line. I don't graduate. And that was motivating. I mean, that was, that was different than, and then you'd start bringing in leading the race and ABC cameras on me and me reliving every moment I'd seen on, on sports shows with people coming across the line and throwing their arms up in the air. And now I could maybe be one of those. And then this other subtle of uh, the girl who never tried very hard at anything. And I found this moment of going all in on something for the first time in my life to go commit completely. Then it was like my body started responding, I mean, in a different way. And so those little pieces all came together to create this really unique moment. Um, but yeah, the thesis was kind of crap. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, there was one article in Sports Illustrated at the time that I could use as any kind of reference. And these guys were just as crazy as I was, you know, they were, you know, they did the race in 1978 and they didn't know what they were doing um, other than they had backgrounds in one of the sports. So yeah, it was kind of funny that, and I, people always say, what grade did you get? And I said, I got a C because, you know, that, that research was terrible, but, you know, I think, you know, Cal Poly wanted to claim me after that. So they had to pass me. <laughs> Oh my God, that's funny. Well, cool. That's awesome. No, thanks for sharing all of that. Uh, that that was the the questions I had submitted, Austin. I'm gonna kick it back over to you to kind of close this yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Ricky. Um, this is some great great questions. I love uh, I love the where they went to as well. We definitely have a few questions here from uh from our participants. Um, so first, um, for for both Patrick and Julie, um. How did you both get involved with Hoka in the first place? Like, how did you come to to get involved with uh, with Hoka? Patrick, why don't you start? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I, I ran the, I applied for the Hoka Flyers program in 2016, and and I didn't get in, and I was I was really disappointed. And um, I loved the shoes. Um, I really wanted, and that was a, an ambassador program at the time, and um, I, I really. I really wanted to use that year to develop more in ultra running. I hadn't done any ultras yet. I just did the Olympic trials marathon that year. Um, but that, that year I ran my first 300 Ks. I ran all three in one season. And um, I, I get finished that season up in 2016 with the, with the world championships were, which were held in Spain that year. I made I was fortunate enough to make team USA. Um, and I, I was at 27th place at the halfway point in the 50 K and I thought if you get top 10, you know, maybe, maybe you can take another chance at, at running for Hoka. Um, and I ended up third in that race, um, you know, progressed all the way to the podium. Um, it, I was in 27th at halfway and, uh, 17th at 70 K. Um, 
at 80K, I was in ninth place and I worked my way up to third. I was really fortunate. Um, and um, directly after that, uh, Mike McManus, who's the, uh, the, our manager here at Hoka, um, you know, hires uh, all elite athletes. He, uh, I got a ring from him shortly thereafter and uh, the rest is history. I've been on the squad since then. So. I love that. It's like uh, it's like the Michael Jordan, right? He got cut from his JV basketball team, and then you know he went on later to obviously be Michael Jordan. So it's a good it's good good lesson there, right? If you don't if you don't be getting ambassador the first time around, just keep keep plugging away at it, right? Yeah, that's part of that's part of running in general, right? And yeah. I'm sure J- Julie has a great story about it as well. So. Well, mine was just I I kind of felt like I wanted to have another go at an elite level of triathlon as an age group athlete. And let me just tell you, age group, age group athletes are ruthless. Um, the pros are much nicer. Um, but I mean, they're just so, you know, they're so committed and they're tough. And so I, when I was kind of trying to get into this age group, elite age group mindset, I was doing a lot more racing and training, and fortunately, I have a good friend, Eric Gilsonen at Hoka, who um, is in charge of sort of the triathlon, connecting triathlon um, pros and ambassadors to the program. And he and I have done a lot of work together. In fact, one of my favorite sports basement stories comes from working with Eric Gilsonen as a race announcer for the, the Alcatraz Traz triathlons. And we had all of our pre-race meetings at sports basement. It was my favorite time of year. Um, to go in, do the pre-race clinic um, as an announcer, and then go shopping. I mean, it's the happiest place on the planet, Sports Basement. I fell in love with it. And the only bummer is being sponsored by by Hoka is that you, you, you can't go shopping in the shoe department. You can go shopping on the periphery. It's like, you know, <laughs> of the store, but you've got to avoid that middle section of the shoes. So I have always loved sports basement. I felt like it's my happy place. And then, uh, you know, so this, this combination of doing the outside in with sports basement and getting to talk about Hoka, it's a company that saw in me, allowed me to be an athlete, an elite athlete from, you know, 57, 58, 59, 60. And I've, I feel like if in any small way, I can encourage women in my demographic to reach for crazy goals athletically and to try maybe from the very beginning to start something and to have Hoka One One be the shoe that they get into for the very first time to try something. It's been a real privilege. So it was just a really great combination of me wanting to be an elite athlete in an endurance sport and have the, the best product on the planet, you know, on my feet. So, and so, and sports basement, you guys have got my heart for sure. That, that is phenomenal. Thank you for that reading, reading endorsement, Julia. That's uh, oh, amazing. That's totally. Um, couldn't heart. have said it better myself and that's like what I get paid for. So I might, I might have to steal that from you there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll start putting that on t-shirts or something. In my happy place, Julie Moss. Yeah. Um, so next, next question actually is a great one for both of you as well. Um, it's who has been the greatest influence or source of inspiration during your career? Um, I'll start. I think um, I, was, I was married to an elite triathlete for 10 years, Mark Allen. And to kind of have the, the chance to watch him train, the dedication, the focus, um, just the commitment. Um, it made me think I, I, I do not have that. He's got something that I do not have. I'm happy to be a B athlete, but to be the best of the best and to watch that up close and personally was, was so inspirational. And we have a son, Mark and I have our son, Matt Allen, and now he's my inspiration to just see him pushing himself and trying new things. Um, so yeah, I'd say the the Allen guys have been my motivation for years. I think my, my father uh, introducing me to running early on and uh, my, my wife in general for how much she supports and travels around with me to all these crazy races. Um, you know, coming coming to the desert in Arizona with me, or standing on a track, a 400 meter track for 18 hours, with with a smile on her face while I while I run in a circle, uh, it seems kind of silly uh, to a degree. But the uh, the uh, the support that those two people in general uh, 
give me is, is really powerful. And uh, it, it makes me want to keep going. Um, you know, I've, I've had a lot of friends that have, that have come in this sport, ran cross country and track and field like I did and went on to other careers. It's awesome. I feel like I, I'm so fortunate to still have the motivation to keep doing this. And, and a big part of it is, is those two people for me. Well said. Well said. Yeah. Awesome stuff. Um, I got, okay. Um, I got two more questions. If you guys have the time, is that, are we good? Just a couple yeah. more. Um, Cool. This one is, uh, is uh, what importance do group training sessions have versus training individually for an event? Um, as a cyclist, I'm, I'm going to cut you off. Sorry, Patrick. You're as good. a cyclist, group training is pretty key. I mean, it's really nice to have a group that you can just plug yourself into to get some of your long rides done. I'm pretty good at doing everything else on my own, but when it comes to these two rides a week that I, I will... It's, I'm there because they're motivating me and they're um, inspiring me and I don't have to think. Um, I can just kind of shut my brain off and just key into whatever's going on. And yeah, so it's pretty key, especially like when you know you're going to be on your bike for, you know, six to eight hours. I think those sessions in particular, the really long ones uh, that Julie's talking about are really key for ultra running, especially when you're in a vulnerable scenario. Um, you know, if you plan to be up in the mountains in Tennessee or South Carolina in my region or, you know, up, up where I grew up in Pennsylvania, um, you know, you, you could run into a lot of wildlife. You need to be careful. You need to know where you're going. It's good to have backup plans. So, you know, train with groups for really long adventures on trails where you, where you feel like you're not going to have much cell phone service. Extremely important. Um, I, I, tr train primarily here or around my home, especially this year, um, most years solo. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of my running alone. Um, and, and I think that I, I gather a lot of my, um, you know, my late race strength, um, especially mental strength from that, um, pushing myself solo, <laughs> uh, you know, talking myself through really low patches, even in training. Um, I like training a lot alone, but but especially in the mountains, there's nothing like adventuring with friends. So that, that is a, those are some of the most special moments I've ever had in training. Cool, right on. And then uh, the last one here is actually, it's still a little more directed at you, Julie, but it's actually pretty inspirational here. It's um, a little long, but uh, it says, uh, I watched Julie in that 1982 Ironman when I was a stay at home mom with a three-year-old and said that one day I would complete an Ironman. It took me 18 years to get there, but I completed Ironman Canada in 2000. Now at 62, I'm looking to redefine my challenges. Any advice to baby boomers with aging bodies that still want to push themselves, but know that speed is fading and aching joints are starting to object. And there's a, it says, P.S. I only wear hokas. I love them. Okay. Well, then I will answer your question since you wear hokas. Uh, Here's the cool thing about being an older age group athlete. It's less about speed and it's more about consistency. And anyone can train for consistency. That's, I mean, you, you, your body may reject you doing certain things, but it will never reject you being consistent with your training and your working out. And so it's, it can be for baby boomers, it could be baby steps getting back into the idea of, of uh, setting a goal. And I would, I would encourage um, this the lady who wrote in this question to find a goal because then everything gets sort of redirected in a very different way. You start making um, your life line up in a certain way. You start getting um, support from family and friends who know that this is something you're working towards. Um, it becomes a priority, which is important. Um, and it's weird because of COVID right now, we don't know, but if she were to say, okay, in 2022, I am gonna do my first half and then I'm gonna do my first full. I mean, that's not an unusual, that's not an, um, uh, for a 62 year old woman who's motivated to just take, um, to just start and start tackling um, those workouts, those uh, brick workouts, which is swim, bike and run workouts. And to just start building up your endurance again. You did it once, baby, you can do it again. All right, fantastic. Um, well, Thank you all so much, uh, Teresa, Ricky, and Julie, and Patrick for that, uh, for this the last hour plus. Um, this was informational and very inspirational. Um, I'm sure to speak for everybody here. So we so appreciate your time. Um, it was great having you. Obviously, we, you know, 
at some point, maybe once, you know, COVID things pick up from COVID, we'd love to have you in store for an event. Um, I'm sure all of our customers would as well. Um, so yeah, thanks again for coming. Um, if you guys have any last words for everybody, uh, by all means, please. Julie? Austin, it's a date. Well, we have a future <laughs> date um, and the happiest place, you know, on the planet yeah. besides Disneyland, so. I'm gonna hold you to that, Julie. And I want to say to Patrick, you, you've so inspired me to follow your career and just um, just wish you all the success. Thanks, Julie. Been watching yours for a long time and loved your speech last year at our uh, our event. And uh, it's inspiring that 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 you're at it. You're you're still after it here. And um, yeah, thanks, Austin, for you know for for having me on. Um, I always enjoy enjoy watching, listening to Julie speak. And uh, this was, this was a pleasure to just chat with everybody. So uh, maybe next time when I'm out in your region, I'm not as close as Julie, but uh, you, know, you know, maybe around next Western States, me and Julie will put on our speed goods and get on the PCT. Uh, and oh, uh, maybe, yeah. maybe, Julie, maybe you'll get a chance to come up to Western States next year. Oh, that'd be awesome. Totally. Yeah. All right. Great. All right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we'll definitely, you let us know when you're coming into town and we'll, uh, we'll roll out the red carpet for both of you. Um, cool. All right. Well, everybody have a great night. Let me, we'll see you next, next Thursday. We have uh, you can, we have Greg McMillan, who I believe is like a sports scientist and also a runner. Um, so I'm sure we'll get a lot of more good information then. Um, but until then, have a great night, everybody. Thank you so much for right. coming and participating. Bye guys. See you, everybody. Bye.